Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Q&A with three young climate activists. My name is Sarah Roberts. I'm an environmental journalist and a children's author, and I am joined by three amazing, inspirational people. So we have Amy Meek, who is the co-founder of Kids Against Plastic and also the Youth Action Lead for Common Seas. We've got Naga Levy Rabpaport. Um, they are a climate activist who hosted London's global climate strike with over 100,000 protesters and was also selected as one of London's most influential people of 2019. And we've got Scarlett Westbrook, who is a climate justice activist and journalist. She was the youngest person in the world to obtain an A-level in government and politics and is the youngest regular policy writer in parliamentary history. So, yeah, you've, you've set the bar quite low for this talk, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for making some time to actually come and chat to us. I have been sent in some amazing questions from some of the pupils who are part of our Eco Schools campaign. So as part of this Cut Your Carbon campaign, um, we're going to start with some questions that will hopefully inspire more people to follow in your footsteps. Our first question is from Poppy, who is age nine. So what I'll do is if I pop it through to Amy first and then we'll go around and get all your different answers, because I'm sure you've all got something new to add. Um, but Poppy asks, what is a climate activist and can anybody become a climate activist? Well, wow, that's a that's a really that's almost a tricky question to start with, but a really good question. And I think one of the amazing things about being a climate activist, in my view, is that I think it is quite hard to define because I think everyone has so many different ways of their own activism, whether it's striking, whether it's education, whether it's policy, there's so many different areas to explore in climate action. But I think the one really common thing between every climate activist is that they have a real passion and care for our planet and just want to do something to try and stop climate change and especially make sure that people and the planet are protected. Um, and I think absolutely anyone can become a climate activist. And I think we need everyone to become climate activists with the way that our planet's currently going and with all of the impacts that we're currently seeing. We need every single person, including every single young person, to be a climate activist in their own way, whatever way that looks like. Amazing. Uh, Naga, do you have anything to add on that? I think what Amy said is really great. I think exactly on that idea there are lots of different ways to be an activist. There's also no right way to be an activist just because what you're trying to do in your specific area, in your school, or with your family and friends, with a small campaign that you might want to run or with a group that you might want to get involved with, just because no one's done quite that before doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it or that it's not real activism or that it's not the way to help save the world. But actually, it's really important that we all sort of carve our own paths. It's great that we can take inspiration from other people, but actually one of the most exciting things about climate activists is that we see so many young people become climate activists all in their own ways and all creating new ways to be a climate activist. So I would say don't try to look for a blueprint or a set of rules um, or a standard to hold yourself to, but actually find the thing that you're most passionate about and find what it is that you're best at and together, that is the most likely thing that will show you the way of how to be the best activist that you can be. Not the best activist for someone else, but the best activist for yourself and the world around you. That's such good advice as well, especially with the amount of comparison with social media. It can always, I think, detract from people even wanting to try in the first place. Things can seem quite scary at first. Uh, Scarlett, do you have anything that you'd like to add from your experience? I completely agree with everything Amy and Nogger have said. I think that a climate activist is anyone who takes steps to protect the planet and it can look like so many different things, whether that's protesting, as we've said, or being in your eco committee at school or eco council or running campaigns to recycle locally. There's so many different things and nothing is too small. Amazing. And I guess all of you started quite young as well. I mean, how old were each of you when you started down this path? Uh, if we go to Amy first. 
Yeah, I was 12 years old when I started the charity Kids Against Plastic with my sister, who was 10 at the time. Amazing. And um, Noga, what about you? I was 17 um, when I first started organising the climate strikes and that was almost five years ago. Uh, so I've been doing it ever since. And really, you know, you meet so many people there who are all different ages and uh, it's not been mentioned yet, but me and Amy and Scarlett have actually all crossed paths as we've gone over the years. So we've all met each other, we've all got to know each other. And that's kind of the great thing about having so many young people in this space is you've all got to um, be there for each other and you've got to stand for each other and have each other's backs and support each other and help each other, especially when you're young, you need each other's help. It's like an entire community that you've formed there as well. And and Scarlett, I know you were very, very young when you started down this path as well, same as Amy. How old were you when you first started uh, down the climate activism route? Um, I was about 10, so I was very young. It seems really strange now. Hey, it, it must, I mean, as an adult looking at you guys and, and sort of realising exactly what you've done, it's incredibly impressive. But I guess at the time you were probably mostly just following your guts, weren't you, and doing what you felt was was right. So what was it, what was it the moment for each of you that inspired you to become climate activists? And this is from Bull, who is 12. Let's start, I guess, Scarlett, why don't we start with you for a change? So when I was in year five, we had a homework, which was to read the news. And when I was in year five, it was the year of the Paris Convention and the general election that was coming up. So when I read the news, it was all about climate change and different politicians saying that we needed to take X, Y and Z steps to tackle the climate crisis. And before this, I had thought the climate crisis or climate change was just this scientific thing that you couldn't stop. But having read that politicians said that they could take steps to stop the climate crisis, it completely changed my worldview and made me realise that actually if they can do stuff, we can also do things to get them to do those things. So I started canvassing for some political parties when I was 10 and that just carried on going and I'm still doing climate activism now. Amazing. Noga, what was your moment that, that brought you down this path? Quite similarly to Scarlett, I'd also learned about climate change at quite a young age and I'd learned it as something that just couldn't be avoided. Um, and it was really scary to think about. And so I just didn't. Um, and it was only when I was 17 that I heard about these climate marches that were happening all over the world. And I'd gone to a lot of protests with my parents growing up. Um, so I turned up to a climate march and suddenly all of these fears that I'd had over so long about climate change that I'd really pushed away because I didn't want to think about it came to the surface and I felt very angry um, and I felt very afraid but I also felt very supported. I saw hundreds and thousands of young people all around me who all felt exactly the same as I did and I felt so moved and so emotional and it felt so urgent to me that we had to do something about it. And even though I'd never considered getting involved in the environment world of campaigning and activism before that, in fact, lots of people who'd spoken to me before wouldn't have really known that I cared about it at all. But actually, it was this moment of finding this enormous community of people who were just as afraid and were just as angry about the decisions that politicians were making without our voices as young people being heard that I found the power within myself to keep organising and I found that strength to go forward and to meet lots of other young people and to get involved in whatever campaigns I could. That's really, really powerful. Amy, um, what about you? Was it a similar experience? Yeah, definitely. I think in some ways, quite similar in the way that I was quite young. Me and my sister, we came across plastic pollution and climate change but actually for us it wasn't through school and um, it was outside of school and we were looking at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals actually funnily enough with our parents um, which if you're not familiar with them they're these incredible uh, goals put together back in 2015 which tackle all sorts of different issues from poverty to clean water to education for all um, and then they've also got quite a few of these goals that specialize on things like um, sustainable cities and climate action and life below water and on land and for us, we saw these these huge world goals backed by, you know, world leaders for over, you know, hundreds of world leaders from around the world. 
And we, we were kind of shocked by the stuff that we found out through them, especially by the fact that some of these environmental issues that we were hearing about were ones that had been going on for decades, and yet so little had been done about them. And the scale of them was just mm. enormous, because especially looking at plastic, you know, most of us will have seen litter when we walk down the street, right? And as growing up, we always, we always grew up, you know, went outdoors and our parents took us walking a lot in the Peak District, not far from where I live. And so we always grew up with this connection to the environment. And of course, we saw litter everywhere that we went. But I don't think it really twigged on to us the fact that this was such an enormous issue. And the fact that we've got a truck's worth of plastic entering the world's oceans every single minute. So even since we've been doing this call, you know, that's tons more plastic going into our natural environment. And I think we sort of had this realisation that if we sat back and went, oh, OK, it's fine. Someone else is going to solve this issue. Don't worry. We're too young to do something about it. Then the chances were that by the time I was the age that I am now, there might be nothing happen about plastic. There's no guarantee that someone else would pick up the gauntlet and go, look, I'm going to do something about this. And we weren't ready to just rely on world leaders, especially to do that for us. And so we decided that we wanted to start doing something. We started very small. Um, and then somehow along the years, it's grown into a charity and Kids Against Plastic is still running. But when we first started, we had no intention of, you know, nearly seven years, eight years down the line to still be running this. It was just a little spark of inspiration that led us to think we've got to do something about this issue. And somehow we're still going to the stay. Do you do you see an end goal with Kids Against Plastic or do you think that this is probably now going to be a lifetime thing going on? <laughs> really? I think it's definitely going to be part of my life now. I think it's been part of my entire teenage years growing up so far that it's really hard to leave something like that behind. But I do feel a bit of a fraud because, you know, I'm 20 now and I was 12 when I started this. But to be here and be the one that's talking about kids against plastic, I feel a bit fake because I, I can't really call myself a kid anymore. Um, but we do a lot of work with incredible young people and young kids around the world. And they are absolutely the heart of the charity. They're way more important than I am in the work that we do. And I think the, the goal for me and the vision with Kids Against Plastic is to really try and empower and support some of these young kids to be the next leaders of the charity and be the ones that can take it in the direction that they want, run the campaigns that they see as the ones that are most important to them. But obviously that's a big target. So that's one that we're working towards. Um, but I think it'd be really amazing to get the charity into that position in the next few years. I think it's it's really great to hear that each one of you obviously turned what would have been a horrendously anxious situation, finding out all these things, and you turn that into motivation instead to actually take action. Um, so that's really inspiring. On that note, I have a question um from Millie who is 11 and she says I'm an 11 year old who wants to take action on climate change where do I start um is there anyone that particularly wants to tackle this question first if not I'll go to Naga. I'm happy to answer yeah, yeah. <laughs> although I think really you know all three of us could do a very good job answering this question um and I hope we all will um I think when you're 11, you might be in primary school, you might be going to secondary school. The first most important thing is to find out whether your, I would say, to find out whether your school has any kind of club. I think a school exactly like this, what this all campaign is all about, is your school is your hub for a really big part of your life. You're going to make so many friends there and you're going to have really old friends there as well. People who support you, teachers who support you, and sometimes people who don't support you half as much. But that's why it's such... Uh, a hub for for all of your all of your teenage years as well so um see if your school's got an eco club see if you can form an eco committee and from there you're you'll be able to find loads of people who are also really passionate this is really important because as all three of us have said none of us really did any of this on our own um that's sort of why we crossed paths so many times because there's so many people in this space and so many people in this very wide community um, that we're all able to support each other all the time. So you really you've got to find people who care equally. Um, once you've found those people, I think the next step is to figure out what it is in your area that's the biggest issue for you. So Scarlett mentioned maybe a recycling campaign to help uh, your school or other uh, 
institutions in your area recycle better to work with um, local businesses and shops that you might be familiar with um, to see what their recycling program is like you might be interested in getting together a community garden um, that might be something really fun that you could go to after school that you could get loads of neighbours involved with um, that could help the environment and that may it, it might be something to do with wildlife um, but all of these things really there's no rules except for these basic questions of who can support me what is it that I want to change in the area around me how can I change that i.e what's the thing that's stopping that from being changed so is it that there's not enough recycling bins from the council and that's why people don't want to recycle is it that there's not a green space that's for public use that we can use for gardening is it that there isn't a rule that stops cars from parking in front of the school um, and there's loads of pollution in the area as a result and then you sort of have to work backwards and go okay well who's in charge of making that rule that's that makes the thing that I don't like happen happen how can I get to them how can I use my power as a collective as a group of young people as a group of teachers parents friends neighbors to speak to that person and to persuade that person that actually I've got a different solution um, and I guess I just add one last thing which is that as a climate activist or someone wanting to get involved in environmentalism your job actually isn't to find all the solutions all of the time it's just to focus on the thing that you can do the best job of that you're the right person for because you're the right person for something and it will likely be the thing that you care the most about so i think find that passion and hold on to it would be my overarching advice that's some very seriously good life advice right there for almost anything as well you can use that for um scarlett do you want to add anything at all i think it's difficult to follow that um, as always with nugger <laughs> one of the most amazing speakers i've ever come across um i think the only other thing i can think of is maybe think about what specifically about the climate crisis draws you so for example i'm studying to be a doctor so i'm currently very interested in the links between medicine and climate change um, and there's links between climate change and every job possible so maybe you could look into whatever if you know what you want to do because 11 is very young um, but if what subjects at school you like you can look at how climate change intersects with those subjects and do lots of research not just on what interests you specifically but also about climate in general there's lots of good youtube videos and some tv programs and people on instagram for example that you can follow and learn as much as you can about it i think that's the best way to um, kind of resource the campaigns that you're doing have all of the knowledge you don't not all of it but as much as you can so that you've always got a response to something if you ever have someone contesting you and also just because the more you learn about it I think the closer you feel to it um, not just about all of the bad things with climate going on but also the positive things all of the good climate news the countries that are passing good laws to decarbonize or adopting good school curriculums um, and then you can also steal the ideas from the things you've learned to bring to your own school and your own community do you guys feel that we um hear enough of the good news do you think that that we are seeing enough of the good news I think something that's really difficult is a lot of the good news isn't usually in our country so we don't hear about it because we don't uh, prioritise international politics or international affairs as much as we perhaps should. I think there's definitely an increase now of avenues where you can get good news. So now I know there's like several Instagram accounts, there's newsletters and the news covers climate more in general now so that means positive stories are not covered more but it's still not as much as it should be, I think. I think our climate reporting is very under-resourced and not as expansive as it should and could be. Yeah, maybe there's somebody listening to this that's going to grow up and do a lot of changes in that area, who can say? Um, Amy, do you want to add anything on the where to start? Um, maybe with your work with plastic, you can add any tips? Yeah, absolutely. Also, I'm sorry for dashing off. I'm the, the light of the room I'm in at university just decided to go off, which is amazing timing. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really great question. And I really, it's hard to add on to anything that's been said already, because I think Naga and Scarlett just get encapsulated it so perfectly. Um, but our charity and me especially, we're really 
passionate about education and education as a tool for activism because I think that like Naga said starting in school and we're on an eco schools call right now but starting in school is such a perfect place to find your activism and I'm not saying it's the easiest place because as someone who at school myself ran campaigns against plastic and stuff you know it's sometimes hard to change your attitudes of your peers but that absolutely shouldn't stop you because especially with everything that we're seeing now in the news and everything that we, we hear about climate change and plastic now it's really hard for people to ignore the negative impact that it's having on the planet and a lot of people even in the time that we've been running our campaign have started to realize that actually you know what this is a really important issue and this is maybe something that we should listen to especially if someone else our age is saying something about it and actually, school can be like a really great hub to start trialing some of your ideas around plastic or whether it's climate change. And if your school doesn't have an eco team already, then don't be afraid to be the trailblazer in that area. Because in our charity, we work with incredible young kids of, of you know, often around the age of 11. And one of our youth members who is 12 now, um, she's been working with her head teacher at her school to single handedly change some of these schools policies around plastic but also start an eco team and actually um, develop that up with the students around her and has made such a phenomenal difference in her school already, just as one singular person who started when she was around 10 or 11 years old. So really don't be afraid to start doing your action in school and there's amazing programs out there like eco schools um, who are there to support you with your work on and different issues and plastic especially we run programs for schools with our charity. Um, but I think the other thing I'd mention is I think sometimes we think that when we hear the term activist, we have to do something massive externally to our own lives. Um, and I think that doesn't have to be the case at all, because if you start trying to completely reshape your life entirely to become what you think is an activist, it can be really hard, especially someone who's young, to try and take that huge, huge difference in your life. So I think really don't forget as well that activism does come in all shapes and forms. And even if you start making a difference in your home and you convince your parents that actually, you know what, this is a really important issue and this is something we should be doing more about, then that's a form of activism itself. You can really start anywhere that you think is best for you and try and fit activism into your life as opposed to trying to reshape your activism, uh, sorry, your life to activism entirely. Because I think as a first step, that's a really big one. And it's so easy to get overwhelmed. And the last thing we need is people to start and then feel like they can't carry on. On that note, um, I've got a question from Lenny, who's 14, and he says, of everything you've done since becoming a climate activist, what are you most proud of? Um, so what is the one thing, Scarlett, that you're most proud of so far in your career? I think Nogger and I might have the same one, um, but it's definitely the September 2019 climate strike. Um, which we co-organised along with hundreds of other young people all across the UK. And I have mostly helped organise the Birmingham one, but I attended the London one. Um, I don't really know why, but stepping on the stage and looking out to see 100,000 people all protesting together for climate justice was like just a moment I don't think I'll ever forget in my life. It was so, so amazing and so special and so cool to see that the stuff that we'd been doing or organising we'd been doing for months and months and mm. often being really frustrated and scared because we didn't think enough people were listening had actually paid off because so many people, 350,000 in total in the UK, but 100,000 just right in front of our face, had listened and had come and had cared so much that they'd left their houses and their jobs. Um, the Bakerloo line went on strike, for example, um, to support us and protest with us and demand climate justice. And I think that was definitely what I'm most proud of. Naga, would you say that that was the same for you? Is that your proudest achievement so far? I think I would have said it, but now Scarlett said it, so I'm going to say <laughs> something else. Um, it, I've been very lucky, which is that after COVID hit, um, I was able to continue doing a lot of work in the climate space um, because a lot of the work that I had started to focus on, and I know that Scarlett does a lot of very similar work to this, was around children's education and climate education. And um, I also focus a lot on with, I work a lot with arts organisations. So I work with theatres and operas and uh, a lot of musical uh, spaces and lots of museums. And um, I'm really, really proud of 
these moments that you get to have when you get to discover how to tell a story about the climate to lots of kids in lots of different ways. There's probably lots of kids watching this who are lots of different ages and actually yourself and all your peers will need to hear stories about climate very differently. Um, and every time I kind of figure out a new way to visualise how to tell a story of the climate or how to tell a more hopeful story or, you know, a, a sadder story about something that might be happening to our environment, um, I know they will unlock something um, in a young person who's watching or who's reading it or who's listening to it. And that is a really, really exciting thing for me. It's something I'm continually proud of because something that I figured out that I was very good at when I came into the climate space was storytelling and and communicating with people. And that's um, a skill set too, amongst many others. And so I'm really proud of the work I've been able to do um, to explain things to people because it doesn't always uh, come easy. And I think it's a skill that takes a long time uh, and a lot of work. And I'm very grateful to the children who've kind of listened and been willing to listen. Um, and I'm really excited to continue doing that work. I think that sort of falls back into one of the original things that you all said as well about each sort of finding your thing, your role, that thing that you can grasp onto and, and expanding on that, the thing you enjoy most, I guess. Amy, is there anything that you would like recall as your career highlight so far? I mean, you've all done so much. It must be hard to pick, really. It really is hard to pick. And normally when I have my sister on stuff like this, it's it's easier because then she can say one thing and I can say another and then we don't have to make the hard decision of picking one thing. Um, but I think it's, it's really tricky as well because doing activism, there's so many personal wins that you get along the way alongside the work that you do. And, you know, I, when me and my sister side this charity, um, we, you know, my sister wouldn't even stand up in front of her class at school and we were both terrified about the idea of doing an assembly to a class of, you know, a couple of hundred pupils. And, you know, now we've been able to, you know, speak at parliaments in the UK, um, at, at UN events, at TEDx's and at, like to, to see how far we've come along the journey because we care so much about this cause is something that has been a real personal win for us, I think. And to see, I think to really show the demonstration that uh, activism can really shape your life for the better and make you so much of a better person than when you started whilst also making a really impressive and important difference in the world around you um, but I think in terms of like a personal one with the charity I think the thing that we have been so proud of is the youth engagement with kids through Kids Against Plastic and we've now got over 300 young people internationally as part of the team that we run who we meet with every Saturday morning at nine o'clock and we have these meetings for 45 minutes where we play games we discuss environmental issues and like Scarlett said earlier we break down some of the bad news that we hear about climate change as well and try and make it something that's a bit less overwhelming and a bit more understandable for, for all of us not just young kids. And also to see the campaigns that they're running through the charity and that we're able to support them with. It's just so incredible to see kids of such a young age be so passionate about something that so many adults and people in power don't care anywhere near enough about. But that we have someone who's six years old, five years old, who's in year one at school and yet comes on a call every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. and talks about building a better world. You know, that for me is the most inspiring thing ever in my life, I think. And that really gives me so much hope in a world that sometimes it's really hard to keep that hope when it comes to climate change. Um, and so I think that has been so phenomenal to see. And that's why I really you know, can't encourage any young people listening enough to really pursue their voice because you are so important. And the, the, the messages that you can spread are so valuable in this space and things that are starting to be listened to even more. But that's why it's even more important to keep going with it. On that note, is there anybody that particularly inspires you most? And this is from Max, who is seven. So can we have a person? It might be the other people on this call by the sound of it, because you all sound like uh, you're all sort of uh, fangirling each other a little bit. And um, I can absolutely understand why. But is there anyone else um, as well? Or, or maybe somebody um, in your family or friend unit or somebody outside of that that you'd like to say? And uh, Nogger, do you want to go first? Oh, I think your mic's off. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's a really hard question. Um, I've got two massive inspirations. 
Um, one of them is my mum, because my mum has taught me absolutely everything about politics. And the climate is a very political thing. Um, when I was very young, she taught me a lot about intersectional politics and what it meant to, and that means that, you know, you, you go out into the world and you see how lots of different changes and policies and decisions are, are connected to one another, um, that we have these intersections of politics and of different um, oppressions that exist in different systems, economic and social systems that exist, um, that all kind of work together and can be remade together. Um, and she taught me a huge amount about that. And when I went into environmentalism, I'd like to think that I also taught her a lot back. And having someone next to me that was willing to talk to me about these things, but also willing to listen was really huge. Um, but my other big inspiration is someone that I think lots of kids might not have heard of. Um, but I thought of her because Scarlett brought up the Paris Convention. And this is a lawyer called Fahana Yamin. And she is a lawyer who's been working in the climate space for a really long time. Um, lots of people haven't heard of her, but she helped to um, really create and negotiate so many of the, the laws and the rules that we have that are good for the climate. And she's still negotiating and she goes to all of the climate summits that the UN runs every year. Um, and she really, really fights for both people and planet. And there's so many people like her that have been working in the climate movement for decades and decades and haven't been noticed or haven't been um, given a spotlight um, or haven't been recognised for the work that they've done. Um, and sometimes you don't need recognition for the activism that you're doing. But I think what she's done is really inspiring in how she's shaped the world that we have today. And most people wouldn't wouldn't know that it was her behind so much of that. I think that's going to give a lot of people um, a, a big opportunity there to go away and research people outside of, of the names that they've heard of. Is there anyone that you would like to throw in the mix, Scarlett, for, for people to go away and look up? I think this is a really hard question to answer and something that's kind of cool about the work that I've been doing is that a lot of the people that I looked up to I ended up working with um, and because I've been so young through it it kind of feels like I've basically been raised by this climate movement um, so I probably spent enough time or equal time in Zooms or meetings as I have in school or at home <laughs> so it feels hard to choose one person out of all of these different ones when it really I generally feel like I've been raised by a community of climate activists and organizers and lawyers and policy writers and so many different people um and I think we probably everybody has a community like that like I also do figure skating for example and I feel like my coach is very much a part of my family and my friends that I make there and everyone else if you do anything outside of school or even in your school you probably have so many different people I hope you do at least who when something goes wrong can pick you back up again or give you good advice um so I would say everyone and Nugger is very much included in that when we did the climate strikes I was one of the youngest in the group um so whenever I had a problem whether that was about climate change or like someone at school being mean to me Nugger is one of the people I would go to and also one of the people I go to now in work context to because they're just so, as you've seen today, they are so eloquent and so clever and always have so many good things to say. So I think my person is Nogger, but we'll see many others. Yeah, I'm definitely adding all three of you to my list of inspiration. <laughs> um, but Amy, is there anyone else that you think needs a mention um, that you'd like to add? I think... We, we always give a mention to a couple of the girls that first sort of helped us on our journey with Kids Against Plastic, well, inspired us anyway, um, who were two sisters from Bali who started Bye Bye Plastic Bags, um, which is a pretty renowned campaign now because they were so successful with it and getting the government to, to ban plastic bags. Um, but also because the, the journey that they've been on as well, they were about a couple of years older than me, my sister, but they also had the same age difference and seeing the impact that they've made with their campaign really showed us that actually, you know, we don't have to wait any longer to get started. We can make a difference too, especially as they were our ages when they started, if that makes sense. Um, and it, one of the sisters who's called Malati is now running an incredible organization called Youthtopia, which is 
helping to support young people internationally with their own activism and building a network of, of youth champions around the world um, and also running things like masterclasses to help educate more young people on so many of the different complicated issues that there are in the world. So I think I just want to give a massive shout out to them because they were really important in inspiring us in our journey and it's been amazing to be able to actually meet Malati a couple of times virtually as well um, and in person along, along the way. Um, and I think a bit like Anoga said, also, I think family for me has been a really inspiring thing, especially as I run my ch charity with my sister and my parents have been hugely important in supporting the work that we do, especially as they're both teachers. So helping us with the education programmes um, through Kids Against Plastic has been so valuable. And to have that support network to actually help us to keep going has been you know, really priceless. And that's why when we talk about support networks and finding your people on this call, that's why I really can't understate it enough because in order to have that longevity with your activism, you need people around you to help you keep going and to motivate and support you. And I really, my family has been hugely important in that for me. On the note of inspirational, famous people, I have got a question from Khadija, who is eight, and would like to know, have you ever met Greta Thunberg? Has any of you ever met her or other famous environmental activists that um, that you're really looking up to? Um, so if we start with Noga. Um, yeah, I've met Greta a couple of times, uh, often in summits of climate activists from around Europe. Um, and I think it's a really great question. It's a really interesting question because actually what those summits taught me, I found those summits very strange because it felt like we'd been selected from each country to kind of represent our, this country. And I'm not originally from the UK, so that felt quite weird in, in the first place. But um, I found it quite strange because I looked around at all these, these lovely other young people around me, including Greta, and thought, well, we've all done lots of things in our own way. Um, and some of us, are kind of recognised and get asked to do loads and loads of things. And some of us aren't always as recognised or, or as acknowledged. And I it was kind of a moment where I went, you know what, you're fantastic, but actually I know loads of other young people who are also fantastic. Um, and I was pretty starstruck meeting Greta, but it was really also a moment for me to go, you know what, we don't need to be starstruck about every activist or every politician. We just need to create more of them um and so i would say you know don't don't pin it all on just one uh activist or all, all of your hopes and dreams because none none of us are doing that alone no one famous is doing it alone and no one not famous is doing it alone so um there's something very exciting about meeting um stars like that and and activists like Greta who have really done an incredible amount um but there's a lot of people on whose shoulders we stand um and I think for so many children, it can be really scary and really paralyzing to see so many other young people essentially get very famous um, from activism. But that's no one's end goal. Um, the end goal is the change that we want to see. Um, so I think always, always try to prioritize that rather than the people themselves always try to prioritize the planet. I think as well. Um that's that's a good point of sort of making sure you're in it for the right reasons because if you are experiencing a lot of burnout and you do need um to keep this longevity up if you're not in it for something bigger than yourself then you might get disillusioned don't you think um what about uh, amy have you ever met anyone that you've sort of been starstruck by in this process well we'll widen the the question on that yeah, I, I haven't actually met Greta, so I can't answer that one. I think um, our charity is quite focused on, I think, more the education side of environmental issues. So I think it's kind of just different circles, unfortunately. But um, there's actually, I think like Noga said, there's so many incredible environmental activists out there who don't get recognition. And some of the people that I've actually met and gone, you know what, they are such an inspiration and so incredible are ones that I didn't know before I met them. So they weren't perhaps the renowned ones that we hear about a lot in the news or in, you know, newspaper articles or, or whatever. Um, and I think that it kind of comes back to that question of 
just because of you know some people get recognition in certain areas um they are absolutely incredible but actually don't forget that some of the best superheroes can be even a young person that is doing being an activist in their own community that doesn't get heard of because it's small scale action um I know it's kind of dodging the question, but I find it really hard to name one singular person that's such an inspiration. I mentioned Malati, who I managed to meet, who was one of my inspirations from the start, who it was incredible to actually meet and connect with in person. Um, but yeah, I think some of the most in impressive and inspiring people I've met have been the ones of the names that you probably wouldn't recognise. And also I've met a lot of activists online in COVID, which really was annoying um, because I haven't had a chance to meet them in person, but hopefully sometime in the future. Um, and I'd also really recommend if you're interested in looking at some of the incredible climate activists that there are out there. Um, first of all, check out networks like Utopia, which I mentioned, which bring together communities of, of activists. But also um, when Noga mentioned, you know, we're on the shoulders of people who've come before us. There's some incredible youth climate activists from, you know, even the 1990s, 1980s who have been campaigning for this issue long before it's been spoken about to the same scale and I think to see the work that they've done and to recognize that is also just as important because just because climate change wasn't being spoken about then as much as it is now doesn't mean that the issues weren't there and it must have been incredibly frustrating as a young person back then to be trying to push for the the action that we're starting to see now um, so I'm going to completely bypass the question but um, I think it's very hard to name one singular person. I, no, I think it's, it's not bypassing the question. I think that's really highlighting how important it is that, you know, everybody does it regardless of the fame. You know, you're going into it for a bigger picture. And, and like you said, there's so many unsung heroes that deserve recognition that don't necessarily get it. Um, and, and they're still going ahead anyway. Um, Scarlett, do you want to add anything to that or would you like us to go to the next question? Um, just echoing what's already been said, um, I have also met Greta. It was when I met Greta the first time we were both doing a media circus in Plymouth in England. And it was a very, really strange experience because we were essentially doing media interviews from 5 a.m. in the morning to like 11 at night. And it felt really weird that all of the world's attention was on hearing what we had to say, like constantly, but then not doing anything about it. Um, which it was really actually a turning point in how I looked at climate communications and one of the reasons why I do journalism myself. Um, I can actually think of one person who I found really inspirational and was a bit starstruck when I met, which is Naomi Klein, who is a really famous climate economist. She's written a lot of really, really good books. Um, if you're a bit older, that I would definitely recommend reading that really explain how all of these systems that we have um, come into play and conflate and interact and perpetuate the climate crisis. That's actually um, quite a good move, uh, a good uh, segment into, uh, uh, sorry, that's actually quite a good segue, sorry, into our next question, because our next question is, are any of you aiming for a career in environmentalism? And if so, what is that career? And this is from Eve, who was 14. So, Amy, would you like to go uh, first? I know you're all kind of studying and, and moving forward in different career paths, so it's quite an interesting point to bring that up. So, Amy, what are you what are you doing right now? Yeah, I well, I mentioned I'm at university. Um, I'm currently studying natural sciences at university, so definitely keeping on the sustainability focus in what I'm studying. But I think really with the ambition to to do something in sustainability. I find it really hard to pin down exactly what it is exactly that I wanna go into, just because climate change science, climate policy, climate education, they're all such rapidly changing fields. And it's really hard to say, this is the one area that I want to go into, especially as they intersect so much. Um, so for me, I'm really keen to go down the sort of climate policy, climate science education route, um, especially as we talk about inspiration, um, looking outside of the youth, activism lens. Some of the most inspiring people I've met have been climate scientists who have been, um, you know, pushing and talking about these issues for decades and really not been getting the recognition and actually getting a lot of um, 
difficulty that they've been facing because of financial interests from big corporations pushing back on climate science. Um, so, for example, Michael Mann, who was a, a climate scientist back in the 1990s, had a lot of issues with that. And it was amazing to kind of be able to meet him in the past. So I think that's really inspired me to go down a route around climate science or policy um, or through that in particular education, because I've mentioned already the power that we've seen through education. And it's a really an issue in an area that's quite far behind a lot of other things when it comes to climate change, because we still aren't seeing climate change properly integrated into the national curriculum, for example, in the UK, which seems pretty crazy to say we're in 2023 and we're pushing so much for climate change and actually we're not properly educating the young people that are growing up to be the future generation on this hugely important issue. So something in that field is what I'm looking towards and keeping the activism as part of that because you know we said earlier I'm probably not going to leave kids against plastic behind entirely at any point and um, keeping down the activism route and keeping inspiring and supporting young people to go on a similar journey to the one that I've been on is also something I'm really passionate about. I also think you're doing exactly right, keeping it broad. You know, you don't necessarily, I think it's important that that um, kids realise you don't have to have one specific career route. You can do lots of different things, you know. You can um, you have the education side and be a scientist and do uh, that within the sustainable sector. Um, so, yeah, keeping your options open is a great idea in my books anyway. Um Naga, do you want to add anything about your career um, and will it be in the environmentalist kind of seg sector? I think I'm actually a really good example of someone who's, uh, <laughs> who's kept their options quite open. Um, I'm not planning to make a career out of um, environmentalism. I've all My plan has always been to go into music, um, but I actually did an undergraduate degree in history. Um, so I sort of went all over the place, really. And now I'm hoping to kind of go into music full time. And um, it's really it's really been useful for me to focus on these other industries that lots of people see as very separate from environmentalism, because the more I work with those industries, the more I know uh, where their problems lie in terms of the emissions that they're given out and also uh, how we can change them and how we can use them. Um, and I'm really, I, I think, you know, satisfied for me with having climate as something that I always feel like I'm doing from the heart when I've got the time to do it. And it's always something that doesn't need to supersede anything in particular. It doesn't need to overpower anything else in my schedule, but it also doesn't need to be pushed aside. It's just a part of who I am, just as all these other passions are a part of who I am um, and it's always been very important to me to never be boxed into just one thing but all of these facets make up me and I think so many kids um, get taught that you can only be one thing you've got to pick one job you've got to pick one thing that you want to do with your life um, but there can be so many things that you want to do so many passions that you can have that can span so many sectors of the environmentalist world or any other industry and pursuing as many of those passions as possible and indulging in all of them will make you better at everything that you do. It will make you a more confident and more knowledgeable activist, a stronger environmentalist, a more powerful environmentalist and a more exciting and engaging and wonderful person to work with. That's so very, very true. And also so important that you take those principles um, with you into different areas as well, because so many of these different industries, although, like you say, they sound completely separate, everybody needs to get on board, right, to tackle these issues. So it's amazing that you're taking that passion with you anyway and, and combining it with another passion. Um, Scarlett, what about you? I've had a really weird career trajectory because I did my A-level so young. Um, so I'm currently working in the climate sector. I'm a climate journalist and I also write climate policy, actually about climate education. Um, so it's a nice link between Amy and I's work. Um, some of it's been incorporated by the government, but not enough. So hopefully the next government will do that. Um, but I'm doing something a bit strange given all of that, which is I'm studying to become a doctor. Um, 
So although that doesn't necessarily have to be climate related, I am really interested in the links between climate change and medicine. So that might be something that I end up pursuing, or I also am quite interested in doing uh, medicine in conflict regions, which is fairly different. I've got a long time until I have to decide which specialty I do. Um, but until then, I'm going to keep up with the activism. And I know that even as a doctor, if I don't decide to do something that's directly climate related, I'll still be organising and still be doing as much as I can. Incredibly, incredibly um, inspiring to hear that from all three of you guys. Um, we're on our last question now, and this one comes from Ollie, who is 10. And Ollie asks, what change do you want to see most? So if we start with Naga, what change do you want to see most? You can only pick one. <laughs> it's such a fantastic question um, because the answer is, is I want, you know, a lot of things to change. Um, I think the change that I want to see can be summarised by the fact that very often the economic difficulties that we face um, and the systems that are in place to, to create those economic difficulties leave us feeling very separated from one another. We've talked a lot about community, um, and I believe that the foundation for a more sustainable, fairer, kinder world that can actually help us survive in the long term is community. So a world in which we are proud of being reliant on one another without exploiting one another, without using one another's resources, but distributing what we already have in a fair way and in an equal way. Um, a lot of that come, needs to come from the acceptance of the fact that we actually have more than enough to go around. We have the solutions, the technological and the environmental and the energy solutions that we need are already there. Um, we just need our policymakers to kind of drive these things into action, to use up renewable energy resources, to transform our education, to transform our politics, to transform our transport, um, to allow us to use cheap uh, or free accessible transport and infrastructure everywhere. These are all massive changes that I'm talking about, but they really come from a foundation that is actually we need to be able to connect with one another and with nature in a way that is kind in a way that is unconditional and in a way that is fair in the long term and that I think has driven me for the last few years to get to where I am today. Amy do you have one that's such a, this is a very different a very difficult question Ollie <laughs> but um, what would you say Amy is the one change that you want to see yeah it's a really really tricky very good question um, and very hard again to follow Nogo and you know their incredible summary of of this um, I think for me I, I've mentioned education so much. I think education is such a key principle for me, and I think it holds so much of a key to solving so many of the world issues that we're facing, not just climate change, but so many of the, the issues that we're seeing and yet not seeing the action that we want to address them. I think so much of it can come down to education, and that's not just young people, that's people more generally in society. I think we get so much of our information in the world from the news and from specific news sources and that can really skew people's perceptions of so many issues but also really lead to that feeling of demoralization and so I'd really love to see better education more generally on climate change to break down so many of these issues that can be quite difficult to digest and really break down some of that denialism um, but also especially young people and education of young people to see it properly integrated into the national curriculum um, of some of the real world issues that we are facing because the purpose of school is to prepare young people for the future and for the world that we're going to live in and I think currently we're lacking so many of the, the, the huge problems that we're going to be facing as young people we're really lacking being taught about them properly in school and so I really want to see better integration of that into the education system. So I think that's my sort of more achievable thing that I'd like to see. And it's a massive thing. But I think if we're looking more widely, I think I'd just like to see 
more people, more world leaders take this issue seriously, because I've been honestly blown away by some of the stuff that we've been seeing recently when it comes to climate change. You know, I, I don't want to get political, but we're seeing the current presidential um, races in the US and seeing people talk about climate change as an issue that is a political one and one that is, is used as a tool in politics to convert voters or to get people to listen to a certain person. I'm honestly blown away because for me, that is the one of the most terrifying things to see is to see people not take this issue seriously with the urgency and the importance that it needs. And so kind of my my bigger focus and my, my bigger ask would be just to take this issue more seriously and to take the, the action, robust action that's needed and do it as something that's apolitical uh, collaboration across countries. But when I say that education is the achievable one, that's because that is the one that I think is going to be very, very hard to actually see happen. But I think when we talk about coming back to the youth activism side of it, that's why all of this work on the ground is so important to try and push for that change higher up. Scarlett, these are these are all amazing points, by the way, to, to have to follow up. But is there any one um, change that that's not been mentioned that you would like to add? I think it's very similar to what's already been said, but we need to address inequality and by doing that I think we then address the climate crisis but also so many of its joint struggles whether that's a cost of living crisis or racism and discrimination and that sort of stuff because inequality is the root of this so with the climate crisis for example the inequality comes from how 100 companies are responsible for 71 percent of global carbon emissions um, another example is that 1% of flyers are responsible for over 70% of flights in the UK. There's an inequality here because a few people are using up way more resources um, than is fair for them to use proportionately. And then we have the same with the cost of living crisis where politicians give their friends pay rises um, and high cup bills, energy prices and fuel prices in favour of having more money for themselves, for example, when people are struggling. And with discrimination, a lot of that is rooted in power inequality, where people who are um, more privileged carry that privilege and don't distribute it as equally. So I think it would be um, embedding, tackling inequality in policy approaches, but also in every organisation so that we make sure everybody has equal footing, um, equal rights, equal justice. And I guess all of that, as you said, can start in your own home and in your own school and span out from there. So thank you so much um, for each of you for joining us today and for sharing all of your experiences and your expertise as well. And um, for any of the pupils that are watching, we have uh, in positive news got over 1,800 schools who have signed up to cut their carbon. So if all the pupils in those schools take part in that challenge, that is 500,000 people um, who will be cutting their carbon emissions in the UK. So it just goes to show the power um, that that you each have as individuals, but the power that you can have as a community, which I think was the underlying message here. Community is very, very important. Um, so just to finish, for um, anybody that's been inspired by this talk today, how can they follow your work? Uh, where can they where can they go to see more? Um, so Scarlett, where can people go to find more about you? Um, so you can follow my personal social medias, which are just my name, so Scarlett Westbrook, but also the campaign that I run, Teach the Future, um, which is an organisation where we essentially write policies about climate education to improve the state of climate education and try and get them passed. And we're currently in most parties' manifestos, so hopefully next election we'll see climate education have a real shift um, in this country. But if you want to get involved and want to support us, follow Teach the Future or read our blog and our website. Amazing. And Naga, where can people go to, to find your work and to follow you? Um, I don't have a website strictly, but you're welcome to follow me on my uh, social media, which is kind of both personal and, and work. Um, 
and you're always welcome to email me um, for anything and everything. Um, I get lots of emails from lots of young people who have lots of questions and I'm always happy to answer them. Um, and my email will be in my, my social media as well, which is just my name. Um, but I'm always here and I'm always happy to chat and help out with lots of campaigns that young people want to run. Um, and it's a lot of what I do. And I'm so happy to see and hear about how many young people have joined this campaign. I think it's going to make a huge, huge difference. And Amy, what about you? What what can people do to follow your work? Or maybe they, if they want to become um, part of Kids Against Plastic too. Absolutely. We do have social media. So you're welcome to um, find us on social media, which is at Kids Against Plastic. Um, but our website's probably the best way to reach us. So our website's kidsagainstplastic.co.uk. And on there, you can find the youth campaigns that we support. You can use our litter logging tools. Um, and you can also join the Kids Against Plastic Club if you're interested. Uh, all you need to do is literally send us your name and a picture of you, which can just be a drawing or a graphic. It doesn't have to be your face. Um, and then you're part of the club and you can get access to our members area, which is um, secret on the website. It's only for kids. And then if you want to get involved in our schools programme in particular, which is Plastic Clever Schools, uh, which is run by Common Seas and Kids Against Plastics. So I can put both of my work hats on there, um, but also with Climate Clever Schools, which is our new initiative. Um, then you can find that on the Kids Against Plastic website or on Plastic Clever Schools um, and Climate Clever Schools that could be UK. Thank you so much to each of you for joining today. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, I know I've learned a lot, so I'm sure that any of the pupils that are watching have definitely learned something too. If you have enjoyed this talk or if you have any further questions, please do pop them in the comments of this video. Um, but in the meantime, thank you so much, guys.